used in larger enterprises in order to support authentication, uh, confidentiality in enterprise communication and, in, and inter-enterprise communication as well. Um, the problem of today, although we are discussing PKI technology and problems since at, at least 15 years, I would guess. 15 years ago, we started the privacy-enhanced mail activity in the ITF, for instance. And although uh, the basic underlying cryptography, uh, <coughs> the asymmetric cryptography like the RSA algorithm is more than 25 years old, uh, it is really not fully de deployed yet. And we have a lot of enterprises making pilot trials, spending a lot of money uh, and trying to get PKI making work in the enterprise environment. And th the problems are really that it is very hard to integrate PKI technology into the existing IT technology all enterprises have. Uh, <clears throat> the experience companies made, and my experience comes from uh, our company, which deployed PKI technology to major customers like Deutsche Bank, like Volkswagen, and uh, companies of that size, uh, that it is incredibly expensive. It is very complex to manage at the end user uh, working place uh, on the PC in case that you're using PKI technology for end-to-end -end security. So managing all that kind of complexity in the workplace is almost unfeasible with current technology, no matter whether you use technology from smaller manufacturers like Secured, for instance, or from major manufacturers like Baltimore and Entrust, or from Microsoft, or whatever you have. It is not <coughs> user-friendly in the moment, and it is completely um, <coughs> end system oriented. As a result, encryption and digital signatures, which you can uh, <coughs> create and use by means of public key technology, are not widespread in use by today. Um, one problem, for instance, is that uh, the PKI technology works brilliantly simple if we have a single tree of trust in the world, if we had that. And indeed, the, the first models which were discussed in the ITF 15 years ago when, when the PEM development started assumed that we will have a common trust tree in the entire Internet. There was even a, an Internet uh, root certification authority in place at the MIT uh, at the time, but it turned out that this does not really reflect reality. Uh, trust is something which cannot be organized in a global sense, in, in a globally unique uh, trust tree. Uh, reality is more, uh, <coughs> that trust is more uh, being used in, in a way PGP, for instance, suggests. There are smaller islands uh, of uh, trust organizations which trust each other uh, <coughs> applications where trust trees are uh, established, but it turned out that of trust is something unfeasible, something which is maybe even not desirable. As a result, for instance, the trust path construction between any two users in the internet might be a very complex and difficult hassle. So if you get an email, for instance, from someone in the world, uh, maybe in South America or in East Asia or so, they might, be in uh, they might be part of trust hierarchies which might be linked in parts together by cross-certification, by uh, means of bridge CAs and things like that. There are many projects in the world trying to establish such concepts. But if you, as a receiver of, an, of a signed mail, and when you try to validate the uh, electronic signature, you have a very hard time to find out 
where the signature which you receive can be uh, validated against because as uh, the receiver, as a validator, you have one or more so-called trust anchors, public keys which you trust. And these might be not those trust anchors where the digital signature which you receive uh, can be validated against. And it's, it's a real hassle to find such a trust path. And current technology, uh, if you look at the, uh, for instance, the S-MIME technology we have uh, is completely end system oriented. That means all operations, rather complex operations, uh, which might include directory lookups and things like that, are being performed in the end user system. And that is exactly one of the problems we have with PKI technology. We need something which <clears throat> takes away that complexity from the end user system, from the end application, to something specialized in that. We need something like, like a, a client-server model. So we need someone who is doing that difficult job of validating a digital signature for us, for the end system. You, you might find illustrated the, the problem of trust path construction if you have the verifier in one organizational context and you have the sender somewhere else and he might be part of a trust infrastructure which is connected through bridging or cross certification and something like that with any other. And in the end, you have to find a trust path between the sender of a mail and the receiver of a mail over there. And in the end, the verification of a digital signature is nothing than uh, <clears throat> finding a cryptographic chain which begins uh, at the private key from the, uh, from the sender and which ends at some trusted key at the receiving side. And finding that chain turns out to be difficult. Another problem is that uh, the end user technology which you have in your workplace tends to be very complex. You have to <coughs> support a lot of different protocols, not only the secure email protocol, not only SMIME, you have to support things like LDAP, uh, possibly OCSP for looking up blacklists of certificates and things like that. Uh, so. Validating a digital signature requires quite a powerful system on the end user side. And uh, <clears throat> given the trend that end user systems by today get smaller and smaller, <clears throat> can be uh, even mobile phones and things like that, uh, you might have a very limited bandwidth on your end user side. Uh, this makes it difficult to imagine that, uh, for instance, with a mobile phone, if you receive a digital signature, uh, checks, uh, CRLs, and things like that. That's simply impossible. So we have uh, another problem is that um, <clears throat> the structure of the outside PKI seen from the verifier, for instance, must be known in some way by the application. So if something in that structure changes, and if PKIs were in wide use, then uh, we would be sure that uh, <clears throat> changes would be every, every minute or so, then all these changes would have to be known in the application, in, in, in the small device. So we, we have examples uh, in, in Germany where we try to uh, set up a bridge CA connecting PKIs of uh, enterprises. Uh, <clears throat> that bridge CA project uh, has been joined by, by major enterprises like Deutsche Bank and Telekom. They founded that. Uh, BMW and companies like that are <clears throat> in that uh, bridge CA initiative. So imagine you have deployed all the technology to all uh, telecom employees, for instance, uh, which we are going to do right now in, in the moment. Uh, 180,000 telecom employees are getting 
uh, technology, including smart cards, on their workplace uh, in order to do secure mail, for instance, with that's mine. <coughs> then all workplaces have installed the trust anchor of telecom. And uh, <coughs> all the workplaces at Deutsche Bank, for instance, have installed in their technology the trust anchor of Deutsche Bank. And they trust as well the public key of the Bridge CA. So if a new member of the Bridge CA joins, <coughs> then, for instance, BMW joined recently, then the fact that the trust anchor of BMW is also a trusted key for <coughs> all these employees has to be installed and downloaded in some way in each PC, in each working place of the Deutsche Bank and Deutsche Telekom uh, <coughs> employees. That, that's a method which uh, really uh, forbids a rollout in, in, in larger numbers. We have to do this away, and we have to uh, have applications and client components which do not have to have the knowledge about the structure of the PKI outside. So the uh, <clears throat> solution in, in the project uh, we are doing at the moment is that we just put away all that kind of complexity from the client side, from the mail agent, for instance, from the SMIM agent, from the Outlook or Netscape uh, mail agent or whatever you have and to put it into a specialized servers and to provide the uh, mail client, as an example, with a very simple API to connect to the server and asking for PKI-related things like, I have that certificate, is that okay or not? Question like that. Uh, <clears throat> and on the server side, all uh, trust path construction, all directory lookup, all uh, CRL processing, or whatever you have, uh, is being uh, uh, <coughs> done. Uh, <coughs> this kind of approach is not really uh, new. Uh, there are various places where uh, approaches of, of that sort is being done. Uh, for instance, the company ValiCert offered services of that kind because they exactly saw that problem that uh, <clears throat> the validation of a digital signature is a very costly and expensive process. And also in the IETF, uh, <clears throat> the standardization process in the PKIX group, for instance, turned into that direction. The PKIX group is in the moment standardizing uh, the protocol between client and server for exactly that uh, purpose. So many people are going in, in uh, that direction. Um, <clears throat> many products are even uh, offered in the moment, yet it is not fully developed and fully standardized and fully uh, deployed right now. <clears throat> so the, the advantages are obvious. You would be able to build very small applications seen from the security standpoint. The applications themselves might be complex, but what the applications need in order to make use of PKIs is very limited and does not require very complex processing power and does not require a large bandwidth in order to deal with. Um, <clears throat> the complex tasks are delegated to something what we call a PKI server. The basic idea is that uh, <clears throat> every enterprise or every organization which runs their own tree, their own PKI, which ends up in, in one route, they run something like one or more PKI ser server which are doing exactly the job of dealing with the PKI. And these PKI servers are interconnected and are maintained and administered by security staff. So it's something like um, <clears throat> bringing some sort of infrastructure support for PKIs into the enterprise and put it, doing it away, uh, pulling it away from, from the end user. And the, um, 
the scenario uh, <clears throat> which we have in mind is that all kinds of, uh, of, of devices, all kinds of applications, uh, I, I don't like these animations, so sorry for that. Uh, <clears throat> be it a, a PC-based application, for instance, your email application, be it something uh, which you are doing on your mobile phone, be it something which you are doing on your, on your PDA, are using an enterprise-based, one or more enterprise-based PKI servers <coughs> for inquiring validation status, for instance, for uh, <coughs> letting the PKI server do the management of public keys uh, in the context of uh, uh, the usage of PKIs and so on. The PKI servers might be interconnected with other PKI servers uh, of other enterprises and the PKI servers, they are dealing with the outside world in some way. They are asking in LDAP directories, uh, they are asking in, uh, through OCSP about uh, the revocation state of, of uh, certificates and so on and so on. And the interface between the application and the PKI server is a very simple one. Oh, there's even more. I just skip this because, because we, uh, we are a little bit run out of time and uh, I was asked to make it a little bit sh shorter. So the goals we have in that protocol is to make all that running. That means we are, for instance, developing the protocols between the client and the server uh, <clears throat> in parallel to what is being done in the ITF in the moment. So we, we are accompanying that process. Uh, we are not intending to do something private, but since the ITF process just started in that area, uh, <clears throat> we are just working in that area and, and also collaborating in, in, in that area. Um, <clears throat> We are developing all the client-side stuff, the client libraries, in order to access a, a PKI server, a client library which might be used by uh, Outlook, uh, by the email client, by uh, the Netscape client, and, and so on. And we are developing such a kind of PKI <coughs> server. The, the architecture in general, is, is the following. You have the application here on your PC or on your, on your mobile phone. You have the PKI server of your enterprise here. And basically, the PKI server runs a larger database, which um, is something like an image of the outside PKI world. It's a, it's a compressed version of the outside PKI world. Uh, the application itself has a very simple and small uh, API to PKI services. In, in the way that uh, the, the application might ask, I have that certificate here, please tell me, can I trust it or not? I just get a yes, no answer, nothing else. But uh, support can also be uh, <clears throat> a little bit more uh, comprehensive depending on the, on the capabilities of, of the client application. Some clients might have specialized um, hardware, for instance, for cryptographic operations, and they just want to have trust path information. And doing the actual cryptographic verification of that themselves in, in their specialized hardware, for instance, all this kind of variety should be possible at the client side, PKI. And he's talking <coughs> uh, to the PKI server over a protocol. Um, a protocol like that is being developed in the IETF under the name uh, DPD, DPV in, in a moment, Delegated Path Discovery and Delegated Path Validation. Uh, there are several other approaches and proposals in the IETF for that kind of protocol. So that's an ongoing process and we are just contributing to that process on, on that uh, protocol side here. The, the core functionality of the, of the PKI server is just to support the client in the path construction, in the certificate and signature validation by asking his local database. Uh, <coughs> 
and in his local database, there might be enough information in order to, to answer the inquiries of, of the application. And if not, uh, the PKI server will uh, <coughs> access his own protocol stacks through LDAP, OCSP, and so on, in order to ask other databases uh, about uh, the information. The whole thing has an administrator interface because um, unlike a, uh, an IP router, for instance, uh, which can uh, <clears throat> manage all the routing information which it gets from the outside in an automatic fashion. Uh, this has to do with trust, uh, which only can be semi-automated. You, you cannot do that fully automatically because, uh, for instance, to introduce a new trust anchor into that PKI server would certainly require someone to look at it and, and <clears throat> saying, yes, that trust anchor is okay, I will install that here. That cannot be done automatically. What you can do automatically is uh, to download um, <clears throat> the most recent versions of uh, CRLs and, and things like that, uh, to install all things which are uh, signed in, in some way and which can be automatically uh, processed. However, we need some sort of administrator uh, interface here in order to, to manage uh, and to, uh, to, um, <clears throat> to enforce uh, security policies of, of the enterprise, for instance. Uh, one uh, advantage of such a construction is also that, uh, for instance, security policies uh, <clears throat> set up in enterprises and so can be easily handled here. It would be awful to handle them on, on the client side and on, on the application side. Uh, however, it's fairly easy to install security policies uh, to enforce them or to deactivate them or uh, whatsoever. And that's exactly uh, what such an administrator interface is also good for. Otherwise, uh, he has something like a learning and growing database about the outside PKI structure. Uh, he <coughs> caches a lot of uh, CRLs, a lot of certificates, public keys, and so on. One interesting point here in our approach is that uh, <coughs> we are um, handling both the digital signature case and the encryption case, the uh, <coughs> confidentiality case here. So the PKI server in our case also serves as a, as a sort of uh, key management facility for the application in the case of encryption, while the uh, approach uh, we have in the ITF at the moment is solely uh, addressed towards the problem of uh, validating certificates and constructing trust paths uh, <coughs> for certificate validation. Uh, one example which, which I al always have is, <coughs> which always comes to my mind is uh, the, the internet routing. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the internet works very well because we have a network of worldwide IP routers. And uh, if you uh, create a new IP address and a new DNS name somewhere in the world, uh, you can be sure that within 15 minutes about, from any other point of the world, that new DNS name can be addressed. And <clears throat> this is being done by... Uh, protocols running between all these IP routers and gateways which <clears throat> forward all that information automatically over the world. Uh, if we imagine we would, we would not have IP routers, we would have to do all the routing uh, on the IP host side, then we wouldn't have any internet, obviously. Uh, it, it wouldn't work. But that's exactly the situation we have with PKIs today. So finding a trust path between any two uh, participants globally uh, is a similar, similarly uh, complex problem uh, like IP routing, but we do not have these routers, and the PKI servers are something to support exactly that in a semi-automated fashion. Um, so one aspect which is also not being addressed in the ITF in the moment is that we want to interconnect IP, uh, that we want to interconnect PKI servers, uh, for instance, in, in larger groups of, uh, 
of enterprises which uh, <coughs> have some, some sort of common trust basis maybe. Uh, <coughs> with such protocols, the information which one PKI, PKI server has in his local database might be uh, <coughs> progressed into other PKI servers administered by the administrator, obviously, who, who takes care of which information being installed in, in <coughs> each PKI server. But that would clearly facilitate the interworking between different PKI islands, which we have today. Okay. Um, there are a number of um, <coughs> slides here. Uh, which uh, I do not <coughs> want to address in the moment. I, I don't know, what, what's about the time? Uh, no, three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> we always get uh, the, the, the uh, question of uh, what has that to do with XKMS? You, you might know that XKMS is an initiative uh, uh, from the World Wide Web Consortium uh, to have something like a key management system in the context of using signatures uh, together with XML. And uh, <clears throat> one basic difference uh, with XKMS compared to what, what we are doing here is that we are addressing only problems uh, which have to do with the use of PKI, which have nothing to do with the creation of certificates. So a CA, certification authority or registration authority, is not involved anywhere in, in that what, what we are doing here. While in the XKMS model, uh, the problem of uh, acquiring certificates and things like that is specifically being addressed. Uh, this is certainly one difference in uh, that what we are doing. We do not need any CA or a RA. We simply assume uh, the certificates are in the world, and how they come there is another problem. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, that obviously XKMS uh, has to do with XML and, and how signatures are uh, <coughs> incorporated in XML formats and so on, while what we are doing here is strictly based on, on the PICA standards, uh, X509 based uh, certification and so on. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And maybe you have some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Wolfgang. <laughs> we can take a few questions and we have a remote mic so that the questions can go out clearly on the internet. There's one right down the front here and then another one here. It's working. It should be. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some parallels with the way that routing is done and with the way that the uh, domain name resolution works. Have you learned specific lessons from uh, exterior routing protocols or from the DNS? No, no, we, we did not go into DNS uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, we did not go in, into the uh, protocols which uh <coughs> progress DNS information over, over the world. Uh, <clears throat> Not yet. Uh, I think uh, the, the problems um, probably uh, only uh, they, they are only in, in some wider sense comparable. But uh, otherwise, uh, the uh, <clears throat> problem of making uh, DNS names worldwide usable are quite different from from uh, <clears throat> that. Uh, well, what it means to find, a con uh, to find a trust path between any two participants. And, and so far, I think it, it, it doesn't make really sense to look into exactly those protocols which, which keep the uh, internet alive. I was thinking rather from the point of view of, of the concept that seems to underlie all three areas of uh, taking remote information, digesting it somehow, and caching it locally. Yeah. The, the problem is exactly to, uh, to have in your PKI server some sort of an image, a compressed image of the outside PKI world. Uh, the problem is that uh, the DNS world, uh, in, in, at least from the standpoint of naming, 
is uh, strictly hierarchical. So the DNS system is, uh, <coughs> is one global hierarchy. And in case of PKIs, you don't have that exactly. And, and so far, um, <coughs> the, uh, the problem he we face here is to, uh, to establish in the PKI server powerful structures, how to deal with that uh, arbitrary structure of the outside PKI world. So it's something more uh, to deal with that in an experimental way rather than uh, <coughs> uh, what we are doing with dealing with the, with the DNS problem. Okay, next question. Uh, um, you uh, uh, compared the work to uh, the DPD and DPV stuff and ITF and XKMS, both of which are, are protocol standard proposals. Uh, it isn't clear to me, are you proposing a, a protocol here or are you offering an implementation or, or merely suggesting a, uh, a good way to do things? Or? <coughs> um, Basically, we, we are working along the lines uh, which uh, have been discussed in the ITF PKX group in the moment uh, <coughs> uh, in the context of uh, DPD, DPV. Uh, however, <coughs> uh, DPD, DPV uh, just started now. There, there's not even uh, an accepted first draft for, for a protocol. Uh, we are discussing uh, requirements for DPD, DP, DPV in the moment. Uh, there are uh, some drafts on the, on the table uh, how that could work, uh, drafts which have been criticized already. And uh, we made the, the current uh, DPD, DPV thinking our basis and uh, <coughs> developed a protocol along the, line, along the lines of that, but uh, not uh, including everything what the, the first uh, draft proposal from, from Denny Pinka, you might know that, includes because he has uh, a lot of things in mind which we believe is not needed here. On, on the other hand, we want to support not only digital signatures, we also want to support uh, the use of PKI for key distribution for confidentiality in, uh, in that approach. So that makes it a little bit different, but basically we, we took the ideas from the PKIX group. So are, are you making your implementation available? Um, <clears throat> the uh, implementation certainly will be available uh, in Germany because uh, we, we have some funding from the, from the uh, German government. I have no uh, idea in the moment uh, how we will handle uh, <coughs> the rights on, on, on that implementation. That's uh, quite unclear in the moment. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I can't say more in the moment. Okay, one last question there, and then we'll have to move on. Just uh, mm, how can an application trust uh, the response uh, from the PKI server? Because it seems the egg and chicken problem. You say to trust uh, the PKI server response, you have to trust uh, the certificate of the PKI server. So to trust the PKI um, the certificate of the PKI server, you have to trust the CA and you have to check the CRL. And so you have the egg and chicken problem, I think. Oh, there is uh, some, uh, some uh, method. Now, it's, it's very obvious um, that uh, the, the uh, application, uh, the client application has to trust someone because uh, if it gets told uh, by someone, be it the PKI server or someone else, uh, you can trust that signature. That trust has to be uh, transported in a secure way uh, over the network. That's very obvious. However, we want to go away from, from the situation that uh, the application, <coughs> for instance, the mail client, has to trust uh, many, <coughs> uh, many instances. Uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, uh <coughs> the Netscape client, which you might have. You have hundreds of, of uh, trusted certificates there. You have to adjust that to your needs and so on, and that might be very uh, complex. So if, if every end user has to do that, that's not very good. In, in that approach, uh, the client has to, to trust his PKI server. So that's a trust relation which has to be established. So uh, we, we can live with the situation that the client has to trust only one public key and it's that of the, of the PKI server. 
and the rest of the trust is by cryptographic chaining and, and, and so on. So it, it might be sufficient to have an SSL connection to the PGI server, for instance, and uh, <coughs> the uh, client just has to trust uh, that public key of the PGI server. Okay, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Can I suggest if you've got any more questions that you catch Wolfgang out of session? I'm sure we'd be pleased to have you let him buy a drink in the bar or something later on. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to welcome our second speaker in this session. It's a colleague of mine, Andrew Cormack from Ukerna. Um, from 1992, uh, 1999 until very recently, he was head of our Janet CERT, and he's moved from that position, and he's now our chief security advisor at Ukerna. And he concentrates on education, information, and policy aspects of computer security. He's also very active in promoting security nationally and internationally as a member of the Information Assurance Advisory Council in the UK and through Terena's CSERT task force. Andrew is going to talk about Moore's Law of Computer Security. Andrew. Thank you, Shirley. One of the, having spent three years working in a CERT, um, where you are very much face to face every day with the operational security problems of sites trying to use the internet to get their business done, one of the advantages of the new job is it lets me take one step back and try and look at what's happening and try and understand it a bit more and I hope come up with some ideas as to how we might address current problems. So this talk is really tracking my thought processes as I, I went through that. Um, I was going to present it as the end of day thought provoking talk uh, so you all had something to think about over the barbecue. I think after the plenary session we all have more than enough to think about already. Um, if anybody wants to talk about this later on uh, I've volunteered for the, uh, the Meet the Speakers session, so I guess I'm going to be on that timetable. But as Shirley said, if anybody wants an informal Meet the Speakers session somewhere near a pint of Guinness, I'll be very happy to oblige. Um, I assume everybody's familiar with Moore's Law. Uh, it was um, stated by Gordon Moore, who was the co-founder of Intel, as long ago as 1965. He observed then that the number of transistors on a, an integrated circuit was doubling every year and predicted that this would carry on happening. And in fact, well, it slowed down a bit. Uh, according to webopedia.com, again, after the plenary talk, I'm being very careful to quote my sources. Um, it was, it's been concluded recently the doubling time is actually nearer 18 months but um, as far as Moore himself is concerned, and apparently most industry pundits, they expect this to continue for ICs for at least another two decades from then 1998. So this is the classical model. This is, this is what Moore's law was written for. Um, number of thousands of transistors up the left-hand side and various Intel CPUs plotted on what turns out to be a nice straight line because the y-axis is a log, logarithmic scale. Uh, you'll note that according to the University of Delaware, who I have permission from, um, the doubling time is actually two years up to the 486 and then became two and a half years from then on into assorted Pentia, uh, Merced and other, other Californian cities. So that's classic Moore's Law graph. In searching for that, I did a search on the web for Moore's Law. What else has Moore's Law been applied to? Um, so some titles of papers I found. Is there a Moore's Law for data traffic? Does data traffic show exponential growth? Anybody looked at a traffic graph recently? Yes, it does. Our incredibly shrinking storage. Uh, I remember scrimping and saving not so many years ago to buy a 40 megabyte hard disk. Um, my, lap, my, uh, my, my laptop PC now has ten times that amount of memory. Memory, not disk. Well, this is interesting. Can we get our economy to grow in sync with Moore's Law? Uh, this was published by a Californian academic. Say no more. Moore's Law influences fibre optic development. Uh, if you've got a Moore's Law effect on both ends of a piece of fibre, does this mean you ought to be trying to ram a Moore's Law amount of traffic down it? Um, 
Again, very interesting in the light of our previous talk. Uh, this was actually an argument that um, technology for copyright protection is doomed because no matter how good your copy protection technology, Moore's Law will mean that in a couple of years' time uh, computers are available to break it. Uh, incidentally, there was, and uh, the grid folks may be interested in this one, I also found a paper which, uh, on a very similar argument, said that there was never the right time to start any long calculation, that it was always better to wait, um, because the machine that you bought next year would be able to do the calculation in half the time, therefore would finish sooner. Um, yeah. So Moore's Law has been thrown at network traffic, at disk, disk space, at money, at bandwidth, at crime. Um, I will count breach of copyright as crime. So what about security? Are there any exponential growths that we can see in the security field. I started digging around. Um, nice logarithmic scale up the left-hand side. Looks like a straight line to me. Actually, possibly slightly worse than a straight line. And the doubling time is a bit less than a year. Great. We found Moore's Law of Security. Any, anyone care to speculate what those numbers are? Breaking. No. Mm. Nearly. So CC vulnerability notes. Uh, again, quoted with uh, permission from CC. Um, and the URLs on the bottom if anybody wants to look up the figures. Um, the next one's already been spotted. Um, that's break in. <laughs> that's reports to CC. I don't know. I, I must ask them what happened in the mid 90s. Uh, but certainly at the beginning of CC's existence, it's a nice straight line there. Recently, there's a, the last five years, there's a straight line. Uh, yeah. <laughs> next generation of kids or the next generation of girls? Um, yeah. Um, could well be. But the, the fact there was actually a decrease in incident response from CERT CC between, I think it was 94 and 97, I found startling. Uh, I don't think you'll find any incident response team at the moment reporting a year on year decrease. So, yeah, CERT CC incident response reports. So my conclusion from this is that, yeah, there is a Moore's Law of, data s of uh, Security, and it's rather bad news that everything is getting worse, and not only is it getting worse, it's getting worse faster and faster every year. Why? What caused this? Well, actually, what causes it is all the things that we said Moore's Law was good for. There are more computers out there, um, many, many more computers. I think people have, since the introduction of... Um, network address translation, people have rather given up trying to count the number of computers connected to the internet, but it's certainly growing very fast. The complexity of computers, simply because their chips are getting more powerful, what a, a standard computer can do, is now really quite awe-inspiring. I mean, I carry around a PDA, which probably has considerably more processing power than the first computer I bought when I was a student. Um, that's great for me if I want to use it, but potentially it means the thing is much more complicated and much more likely to break down. Certainly there is much more bandwidth connecting the computers. Um, in security terms, we suddenly became aware of this um, so just over two years ago when people invented distributed denial of service tools. And everybody in the security community said, yeah, we could have thought of that. Um, none of us had. Um, and the effect was immediate on a couple of large corporate, organ large commercial organizations, um, purely because there is so much more bandwidth out there if you want to go looking for it. Number of would-be intruders, I hope it's not exponential, but it's certainly growing. And their level of technology, the level of tools available to them is certainly growing at a phenomenal rate. Note I've said very definitely not the skill of the intruders. Uh, the vast majority of people out there causing problems on the internet have probably less technical skills than anybody in this room. But they can download a tool and they can run it. Bandwidth connecting intruders to computers, also growing. And the CPU power available, which matters if you want to do things like password cracking, um, breaking encryption uh, pr protection technologies, things like that. At the same time, as all this is going on, there's also a lot of growth in our reliance on computers. 
when I bought my machine when I was a student, I wanted to use it to learn BASIC. Now, high ambition, it was a long time ago. I never did. Um, more interesting things came along. I think they've been mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> I hope, she, fortunately, it's a bank holiday at home, so she's not going to be watching on the, uh, on the internet broadcast. We're using computers now as part of our everyday life. They're not toys, they're, not, they're, they're tools now. Um, I don't use mine for home banking because I've yet to find a bank that can tell me what the risk is. I know what the risk is with a credit card. I walk into my bank branch, they give me a, a leaflet for, you know, you're a technologically literate person with a large bank balance, you ought to be doing home banking. What's the risk? Pardon? Now, tell me what is the risk to me as a customer, and then maybe then I can evaluate it and decide if I want to do home banking. Um, I haven't found a bank who will do that yet. I'm using it for study. I'm, at the moment, a classic student with our Open University. I use my computer to write my essays, to take notes, uh, all these sorts of things. I deleted a file, which lost me a week's worth of evening. Um, must remember to take backups. Um, we're using them for our employment, um, online, for searching for employment, applying for employment, uh, possibly even getting recruited, and certainly in our jobs. And the interesting question, certainly for people working in cert teams, how many of us now actually rely on computers for our reputation? My reputation is largely built through these things. So I am very reliant in somebody not breaking into it and making a mess of it and the next slide being what I expect it to be. There is a... Yes, I have time. Um, those in the UK may have heard recently of a, an examination being held at a... I think it was one of our private schools where the uh, pupils got a bit of education they didn't expect because the master who was invigilating at the front got very bored watching this class of students for three hours. And it's boring watching you lot for half an hour. He was watching students for three hours. Um, decided there were more interesting things to look at on the internet. Uh, there were. What he'd forgotten was there was a big screen behind him. <laughs> um, the, the press release, I believe, said that he's currently on long-term sick leave. <laughs> um, beware, your reputation may be at stake. More demand for ease of use. Uh, I was horrified to walk into my local supermarket and see a great big box, a great big pile of boxes saying, Internet Ready Computer. Uh, I was looking for an inter Internet Ready <coughs> Shopper and I couldn't see one. Um, even oven ready chickens, you have to know how to work the oven. An Internet Ready Computer, you don't even need to you know, plug it into the mains and it's ready and off it goes. Um, it's scary and people are buying these things. I'm sure you can get them on your um, bonus points if you spend enough nowadays. And these things are getting much more interdependent. If I do home banking, potentially an attack on my computer isn't just an attack on my computer anymore. It could also be a channel for an attack on the bank's computer. The big issue which is hitting a lot of UK companies is all these people with laptops. They take them home and they plug them into their ISP which hasn't got automatic virus protection on it. And they bring them back into work and they plug them into the work network. And one of the ways that virus infections, particularly NIMDA, while that was around, were getting spread back into places that are disinfected, was these machines going off-site and coming back again. We used to worry about viruses coming in on floppy disks. Now they're coming in on laptops and PDAs. Unexpected consequences of attack. Um, the idea of something like a distributed denial of service attack was easy. You know, we knew you could imagine what that might do, but the fact that it might take out a major e-business, probably <coughs> nobody had thought of that. You may find that an attack on one system will trigger vulnerabilities in other systems apparently completely unrelated just because of this great um, connectedness between them. So... We've got all this Moore's Law growth that we've had for the last what, 37 years and everybody says it's great, it's a good thing. But who's actually benefiting from it? Uh, is it the good guy trying to do his work at home? 
or well, I've got the animation right. Or is it actually the person who wants to make a mess of the internet um, to make their own short-term profit out of it and uh, leave it in a, an unfit state for the rest of us to rely on? I've briefly, sort of in passing, mentioned, of course, the, the best example of exponential growth of all. Uh, if anybody's seen this graph, um, if you can't read the scale, the ticks along the bottom axis are four hours at a time, and the ticks on the y-axis are 50,000 compromised hosts. That is the spread of Code Red Mark II on, I think, the 18th of June, 19th of June last year, which compromised something like 350,000 machines on the Internet in 16 hours from a start of a very few. This one, of course, isn't a, because I've had to copy the graph respecting the intellectual property, oops, which I haven't attributed. There we are, sorry. Uh, respecting <coughs> IPR, I've had to leave it on the original linear scale. That is horrendous exponential growth. And that's what's now possible with this hugely increased bandwidth, hugely increased speed of computers. That raises the question of how bad it can get. And Moore's law says 18 months, we double. Cert CC incident reports, we're doubling about every 12 months, possibly a little less. Anybody want to speculate on code red? What was the doubling time? I made it 20, but yeah. Uh, which isn't much when you go from one infection to two infections to four infections to eight infections in an hour. It's about five, six hours down the line that du the doubling kills you. Does it matter? Uh, not much, maybe, if networks are for research and playing with. Uh, we can probably live with it. We can write research projects on it. Okay, there's a research organization. There's a really nice paper on the spread of code red. So, actually, vulnerabilities are a good thing for them. They can measure them. But, certainly, most of the governments in Europe seem to be coming out with statements that the Internet, whatever it is, and they don't seem quite clear on that, is the foundation for society in the next year, five years, ten years, whatever. Uh, the UK government has published a statement that all government services will be online by 2005. Well done to all those in the UK for keeping a straight face. Uh, it's not going to happen, but that's the intention. And that means all government services. You can already file your tax return online if you can persuade the server to stay up long enough. There are websites run by medical professionals where you can submit details of whatever you caught and say what is it, what drugs do I need. Uh, potentially you will be able to get your prescriptions back over the internet. Now, anybody see a problem here with the network not being secure? Um, the next one may be of more or less concern to you. We are certainly doing trials of e-voting in the UK. Um, and I think the, the interesting question issue there is that the trials of e-voting, everybody has looked at this and said, my God, it's wide open to fraud. And then they've actually backported that idea and discovered that actually the existing system was wide open to fraud too. Um, if you can defraud an e-voting system, you can probably use the same technique to defraud a postal voting system, which we've just enlarged to encourage participation in our elections. Okay. And as if that wasn't bad enough, is that what the man in the street worries about when he hears about the computers and the internet? Probably not. Their perception is actually even worse than things really are. How often do you hear computer error blamed for something and just let it pass? And you know darn well that it wasn't a computer error, it was an error in the person typing the data in. <coughs> Uh, your bank statement doesn't match because of computer error. No, my bank statement doesn't match because you forgot to press the decimal point. That's not a computer error. But everybody out there, the big people using computers, all you know, 
don't denigrate their, 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 their systems. You know, it's far easier, and they see it as far more acceptable, to say, it's the computer that's unreliable, the staff are perfect. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And it's horrible for their business if they're actually trying to make us do e-banking. That every time we phone up, they say, oh no, the computer's at fault. Well, I'm, thank you. I'll stick to talking to the, the perfect people in the branch. That's the message you're putting out. So we expect computers to fail. E nearly as often as trains. <laughs> so, if you look at all the surveys of attitudes to the internet, and <laughs> we're not talking about we won't ask for prescriptions online. We won't even shop online. The risk to me in putting my credit card into a website, secure website, insecure website, I don't care what it is, I reckon is the price of two first class stamps. If you read the contract, it's £50. But I'm told that if you write them two letters saying, no, this really is a fake transaction and isn't anything to do with me, then they'll waive the £50. So it's two first class stamps. But we won't do it. Every survey says, fear of fraud, stopping me doing e-shopping, stopping me doing e-commerce. And yet, in three years' time, our government says we're going to be running our lives on these things. There's a huge mismatch somewhere. So, oh, I left that building. There's a terrible lack of understanding of what the threat is, even among the people running the systems. There's, huh, are there any rational assessments of risk out there? But talk about computer and risk. It's wonderful just how wild the, the changes in perception and what the threat is are. And wildly unpredictable behavior. I'm very glad I don't work in business because I have no idea how as a businessman I could actually set up a business plan that involved the public and computers because I've no idea how they're going to react to them. They may come along and say, yes, love them, wonderful, have my credit card, have my personal details, have my wife. Or they may say, no way, I'm not even going to tell you my name. You're a security risk. You don't want to know who I am. Data protection. I'm not here. How can you plan a business on that? You legislate. We've heard about that. So what can we do about it? We've got to change somehow from this belief that computer error is the excuse for everything to an idea where safe computing is not only spoken about but is, is believed and really you know, people base their lives on the idea that computing can be safe. Not perfectly safe. We base our lives on the... You know, I drove down from Dublin last night, three of us, four of us, um, because we thought the roads were reasonably safe. And every time we cross the county boundaries, anybody been driving? You notice the first thing you get, you know, not welcome to green county Limerick. It's the number of people killed on the roads last year. I think it's, I think it's 89 in county Limerick. Now, this is the welcoming face of Ireland. We kill people on our roads. But it's safe enough. We can plan around it. If anybody knows what the two numbers are, by the way, we've been discussing this. Because uh, sometimes one's bigger than the other and sometimes the other's bigger. Um, so safe doesn't mean completely safe, but acceptably, understandably safe. And that means everybody who's involved in computers needs to think about proactive security, not the sort of reactive tidying up after the mess. We can go on doing that forever and it'll keep us in a job and that's fine. But it won't give us an internet computers we can build systems on, build our lives on. And that's everybody. If you're designing systems, if you're programming systems, if you're implementing and maintaining systems, if you're operating systems, if you're using systems, and if there's anybody out there I've forgotten, you too. This has got to be the mindset. I love risks. Everything has risks. Drinking tap water has risks. Not drinking tap water has risks. Sorry, nothing is safe. There is a risk that I will step off the podium and fall flat on my face. However, I saw a lecturer do it at college, so if I learn nothing else, I learned that one. 
Interestingly, there's a much, much lower tolerance of risk on systems that we don't think we control. We had, in the UK, a train crash about a month ago where seven people were killed. One day, one train crash, seven people. And people stopped using the trains. And yet, I'm sure that in that same day, more than seven people were killed on the roads. And nobody stops going on the roads. Because on the roads, we feel in control. It's always the other idiot. Never our fault. And as long as we feel we don't understand computers, there's going to be a very, very low tolerance of risk. And there's going to be this demand for no 98% isn't good enough. It's got to be 100% good. We'll never get there. So not only try and understand yourself what the issues are, but help others. Which... I'm sorry, means the production internet can't be the Wild West. Um, it's often described as such, and as long as we describe it as such, that's what it'll be, be a self-fulfilling prediction. I'm sometimes wary about talking about security because everybody thinks they know what they mean by it. And it's never anything that hurts. Security doesn't hurt you. Lack of security doesn't hurt you. Safety, I, I like. Um, I know the difference between something that's safe and something that's unsafe, and I know if I do something unsafe, it might hurt. So, almost all my talks, anybody who's heard me before will know, I try to come back to the real world. Why invent new ideas when there are old ones? Driving down from Dublin, we uh, got the Volvo estate. If I say Volvo, what's the word that comes to mind? Yeah. How about that one in... Thank you. Somebody knows I'm colorblind. Could be green. And that's safe design and build. Volvos are wonderfully safe cars. They've got, it had, all, it had acronyms all over it, most of which I'm sure had something to do with safety. And I felt good. Um, safe maintenance. You know, I rented it from Hertz a reputable company, not Joe's back of the lot second-hand hire card. I also noted it only had 1,100 miles on the clock, so with a bit of luck, it doesn't need maintenance yet. Safe vehicles. How do we make our vehicles on the information superhighway safe? Safe drivers. I hope I was that. I do the best I can. My passengers were very good and contributed greatly to the safety, mostly by telling me where the road signs were and the old traffic light. And I don't think there's any difference between the tarmac highway and the fibre highway, copper highway, broadband, broadcast highway, whatever you're using. So my challenge, really, to for the barbecue and for... The rest of your lives. This has been. I've got to build up to a grand finish here. Um, about 15 years ago, everybody bought and sold cars based on speed and performance and the good looking woman in the passenger seat on the adverts. Anybody remember those? Nowadays, you buy. Look at the car adverts. You know, people are putting their babies to bed in the car because it's the safest place. You take your dog for it. Sorry if this is, these are only UK wide adverts, but. I'm sure they're not. They spend so much on them, they've got to use them worldwide. Now, the cat goes and shelters under the car because there's a thunderstorm. Now, 15 years' time, let's have the cat going and sheltering under something with intel inside. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew, for thought-provoking talk. Before we go on to questions, I should explain that Andrew is colorblind. When we got in the car last night, after he decided he was going to be the, the driver, he told me he was colorblind and couldn't tell the difference between the traffic lights when it was night. So green traffic lights looked white. So every time we came to a traffic light, it was, Andrew, this is a traffic light. It might change to red. Be careful. So he was a safe driver, and we got here all in one piece. Now, any questions for Andrew? One at the back. And if we can wait for the microphone again. 
First, I have to confess, I'm one of the people who shop on the internet. The reason I don't do it more has nothing to do with safety, security, or anything, but with the fact that my favorite shops don't ship to Norway. Mm. Um, the things you pointed out as being design flaws is actually what makes us go away, or what, what makes us who design stuff and run it uh, get away with sloppy security, which is users are prepared to accept computer error, no matter what happens. Um, if the SAS system for ordering airline tickets is down two days in, during the weekend, oh well, no problem, it's a computer system, that's okay, I can always phone them. If the phone system is down for more than 20 minutes, um, so it's, it's not, I'm not sure if it's a flaw, in some ways, it's, it's actually a feature that people are uh -huh. willing to accept the bad security because yep. we can get away with it. Uh, are you saying that that is likely <laughs> to change? Um, certainly the suggestions from our governments and I think most of the other governments I have heard from, they are all talking about saving money by moving things online. Um, and probably making things cheaper by moving things online. So it then becomes an interesting choice in the consumer of do I save money by going for this thing that might not be there for two days over a weekend? Or do I pay more money for, to use the premium service of the bog standard telephone, which will be there? Um, I think that will make people think about the decision in a way they don't at the moment. And I think you're quite right that there are, for most of the things we do, online, there are, there are alternative backups. So if the computer doesn't work, fine, we, we can phone or whatever. Um, but I, I think it's going to change. Um, so the really inter interesting work on security that I've seen is about evidence. One of the problems we have is that uh, catching perpetrators, but one obvious perpetrator is a, an organization that sells software which isn't fit for purpose. And how, how about just having legal, the reason that cars are safe is that people in America who sold cars that killed people were sued for very large amounts of money. That's much more of a reason than nice advertisements with babies. So how about we have a nice class action against a certain large company? I, th I think even then you'd have problems catching the perpetrator. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Right, can I say once again, thank you very much to both our speakers. They were both very interesting. And can I remind you that the bar...